فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلا يوم الدين أما بعد وإن شرح ذي كتاب التبيان في أداب حملة القرآن رتن باية الإمام النووي رحمه الله تعالى الباب السادس في أداب القراءة وهو معظم الكتاب ومقصوده هذا الباب هو هو مقصود الكتاب وهو من وهو منتشر جدا وانا اشير الى اطراف من مقاصده كراهه الاطلاء كراهه كراهه الاطاله وخوفا على قارئه من الملاله فاول ذلك انه يجب على القارئ الاخلاص كما قدمناه ومراعاه الادب مع القران فينبغي ان يستحضر في نفسه أنه يناجي الله تعالى ويقرأ ويقرأ على حال من يرى الله تعالى فإنه إن لم يكن يراه فإن الله تعالى يراه. نعم. Those brothers are here if you can just move towards the left. Those brothers are here. If you can more of you just move towards this side because sisters might come through. So Ibrahim, yes, it's over there. Chapter 6, Manners Required During Recitation. This chapter is the main purpose of the book and is therefore quite long. So this, the author now is going to go into the fifth, uh, sorry, the sixth chapter. And as he said, Rahimahullah, uh, this is going to be about the etiquettes of reciting. And this is the biggest part and the longest a portion of the book and it's the intent of why the book was authored. So the fifth and the sixth chapters are really the, the reason why he authored this book. Now, I will, however, point out that which is particularly important so as to avoid making it too long and hence avoid boring the reader. So here the author says, and وَأَنَا أُشِيرُ إِلَىٰ أَطْرَافٍ مِنْ مَقَاصِدِهِ What I'm going to try to do, inshallah ta'ala, is I'm going to mention the intended. I don't know, I do dislike karahat al I just want to, I want to stay away from speaking too long and being lengthy. And fear that I might, I might make the individual who's reading get tired and bored. وَخَوْفًا عَلَىٰ قَارِئِهِ مِنَ الْمَلَالَةِ Malala Malala means boredom. The person will feel bored and feel uh, yeah, bored basically. He won't be able to carry on reading. So, I'll, because of that, I won't make it long. The first, one, the first of these points is that it is necessary for the reciter to be sincere in his intention in reciting, as has been mentioned before. So, the first thing that he says that is needed is ikhlas. And we always say that ikhlas means ikhlasuna lillahi safil qalba min iradatin siwahu fahdar ya fatin. That the person. He purifies from his actions any purpose and any objective other than Allah. Now, and to behave appropriately towards the Quran. The second thing he mentions is wa muraatul adabi ma'al Quran, and that the person observes manners when reading the Quran. This chapter is going to speak about that. What manners that a person needs to observe when reading the Quran. Now. He should be aware that he is talking to his Lord and recites as though he can see Allah. For even if he cannot see him, Allah sees the reciter. So again, the, the reciter is that in his heart he feels that he is having a dialogue with his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he should also read like a person who can see who Allah, or he can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you can't see Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can he can see you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reciter should clean his mouth using siwaq. The author then says, فصل في استحباب السواك لقراءة القرآن وينبغي إذا أراد القراءة أن ينظف فمه بالسواك وغيره والاختيار في السواك أن يكون بعود من أراك 
ويجوز بسائر العيدان وبكل ما ينظف كالخرقة الخشنة والإشنان والأشنان وغير ذلك وفي حصوله بالإصبع الخشنة ثلاثة أوجه لأصحاب الشافعي رحمه الله أشهرها أنه لا يحصل والثاني يحصل والثالث يحصل إن لم يجد غيرها ولا يحصل إن وجد ويستاك عرضا مبتدئا بالجانب الأيمن من فمي وينوي به لتيان بالسنة قال بعض العلماء يقول عند السواك اللهم رب اللهم بارك لي فيه يا أرحم الراحمين قال المرداوي من أصحاب الشافعي يستحب أن يستاك في ظاهر الأسنان وباطنها وباطنها ويمر السواك ويمر السواك على أطراف أسنانه وكراسي أطراسه وسقف حلقه إمرارا رفيقا قالوا وينبغي أن يستاك بعود متوسط لا شديد اليبوسة ولا شديد الربوة ولا شديد الرطوبة فإن اشتد, فإن اشتد يبسه لينه بالماء ولا بأس باستعمال سواك غير ذا ولا بأس باستعمال سواك غيره بإذنه وأما إذا كان فمه نجسا بدم, بدم أو غيره فإنه يكره له قراءة القرآن قبل غسله وهل تحرم قال, الروي قال الرويانِ من أصحاب الشافعي رضي الله عنه عن والده يحتمل وجهين. The reciter should clean his mouth using siwak, also called miswak, or anything else before reciting. So here the author speaks about that it's recommended to use miswak, to use a miswak before you recite the Quran and you clean your mouth. He talks about that now, specifically using a siwak. Hey, yeah? And it is preferred that the siwak be from the Arak tree. So now, what type of siwak is the best? It's the Arak. It's from the tree of Arak. And it would have been better if we bought different siwaks and showed you guys which one it is. It is permissible to use any other kind of stick used for cleaning or anything else that can be used to clean the mouth, like a rough cloth. So the person can use anything else can be used. For example, a person can use now toothbrushes. Okay, and anything else can be used. It doesn't matter. It, can, it doesn't have to be necessarily a siwak. Hey, yeah? With regards to the reciter cleaning his mouth with his finger. Now the person doesn't use any of that. He uses his finger to clean his mouth. What about, what's the situation like? There are three different opinions among the scholars of the Shafi'i school of thought, may Allah have mercy on them. So now we're talking about what is it in terms of reward? Can you, you're using your finger. He says within the Shafi'i madhab there's three. And Imam al is a, a Shafi'i. Now. The most popular of these opinions is that it is not adequate to clean one's mouth with one's fingers. So one shouldn't. The second opinion is that it is adequate in, in any case and the third is that... Second opinion is that he should and he can and he... And the third one is? And the third is that it is acceptable only in the absence of any other more appropriate means. So the third one is that he should use a siwak but if he can't find a siwak he's then entitled to use his fingers. The reciter should use the siwak by starting from the right side of his mouth to the left. The, he should, so he should start with what? The, this is only when it's what? Hmm? No. It's the only time you have to start from the right is when? Huh? Huh? If you're doing it ittiba'a li sunnah, but if you're doing it to clean your mouth from dirt, then the dirt you always start with the left. Because the Prophet ﷺ always used to do good things with his right. So, huh? When you go to the toilet and you do, you, you do your 
you see which with, with hand? Your left hand. So when you're doing it the first time and you're brushing your teeth the first time from dirt, then you start with the left. But if you're doing it not because your mouth is not clean, but you're doing it sunnah, you're doing it to follow the sunnah, then in this situation what do you do? Huh? Now, you start with your right now. Because so here, the person here is doing it, should have brushed his teeth before. Even if he has brushed his teeth before, when he's using the siwak here, is for what? It's for sunnah. Now. So the reciter should use the siwak by starting from the right side of his mouth to the left, and he should form the intention of adherence to the sunnah. You see? So he's doing it in adherence to the sunnah and following the sunnah is something good and it's something that you're now not cleaning your mouth from it so in this regard it is what? it's from the right now some scholars have stated that he should say oh Allah bless this action for me while you should say well. some scholars they said that he says this dua Allahumma barik li fihi ya arhamar rahimin oh Allah bless Bless it for me, the most merciful, my, oh my Lord. Again, this is a ibadah and a ibadah needs a... This is a ibadah and a ibadah needs what? It needs an evidence and it needs a nas, textual evidence. So we say that this is not uh, it's permissible because there's no evidence for it. Alama Wardi, one of the companions of Imam Shafi'i, he stated that the Prophet said, it is recommended that both the front and back of the teeth be cleaned and that the stick be moved along the edges of one's teeth, one's molars, and smoothly along the top of one's throat. So here, Al-Mawrdi, Ya Ikhwat Al-Khilam, our ulama explain everything, even how to brush your teeth, and how to do it. So, and that's not something shocking, because even the same thing has been transmitted from who? The Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. The same was transmitted from him. Narrations have mentioned that he would brush his teeth sallallahu alayhi wa so much so until he would say ur, ur. The narration mentions so. so the Prophet would do that So these are the narrations that they brought and the understanding is that that the person he does the outside of his teeth and he does the inside of his teeth inside as well and also once he has done that, so he's, run, he's done his incisors, he's done his molars, he's done his canines, huh? everything, he sorts it all out. Then, وَسَقْفِ حَلْقِهِ He also does that, up to the saqaf of his teeth. إِمْرَارًا رَفِيقًا like Very nicely, slowly. And with the, as they say, the roof is connected to the tongue. With the? Both of them is connected the tongue. All of that. And it is from the saqaf and the tongue where the odor comes from. The person doesn't brush. <coughs> now. The scholars have also stated that one must use a stick of average length and one that is neither too dry nor too wet. So look, the length shouldn't be too long. No. Shouldn't be too short. No. It also shouldn't be excessively dry. And it also shouldn't be excessively what? Wet. So it shouldn't be shadidul yubusa. Shouldn't be yabis. And it also shouldn't be shadidul rubut rutubati. Rutuba means what? Wet. Should it be excessively wet as well? If it is too dry, it's maybe moistened with water. So if the person feels like, the, okay, this is a hard one. You go to a family, they give you a hard one, they've kept in the fridge. You see, or they've kept it for months. Then what you do here in this regard is, you try to wet it. Take water and wet it. It is also acceptable that someone else's siwak be used with their permission. Also, you can use somebody else's siwak if they give you the permission to use it. Would I suggest somebody to use somebody else's siwak? Not at all. 
But can it be done if you both feel comfortable with each other? You could, you could do so if you wish to. But I think everybody should have their own. They should get their own one. It is disliked that the recites are recital for Quran if his mouth is bleeding or contains any kind of impurity without cleaning it first. So the author here says the person's mouth is bleeding. For them to go and read Quran whilst there's blood in their mouth, you see, for you know, yukra, this is dislike. Ah, oh, this is dislike. Do the, doing this so, you go and rinse out your mouth. As to whether or not reading this state is actually forbidden, Riyani, another of the companions of Imam Shafi'i, stated that there were two opinions regarding this. Is it haram? We, he said he mentioned that it's disliked. But is it haram? He says, قَالَ الرَّوْيَانِي الرَّوْيَانِي means Ashab al-Shafi'i is from the Shafi'i scholars. He mentions from his father, يَحْتَمِلُ وَجْهَيْنِ Both are possible. Sometimes it can even be haram and sometimes it can be uh, makruh. فَصْلٌ فِي حُكْمِ قِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ بِغَيْرِ طَهَارَ <coughs> ويستحب أن يقرأ وهو على طهارة فإن قرأ محدثا جاز بإجماع المسلمين والأحاديث فيه كثيرة معروفة قال الإمام الحرمين رحمه الله ولا يقال ارتكب مكروها بل هو تارك الأفضل فإن لم يجد الماء تيمم والمستحاضة في الزمن المحكوم بأنه طهر حكمها حكم المحدث وأما الجنوب والحائض فإنه يحرم عليهما قراءة القرآن فإنه يحرم عليهما قراءة القرآن سواء كان آية أو أقل منها ويجوز لهما إجزاء القرآن على قلوبهما من غير تلفظ به ويجوز لهما النظر في المصحف وإمراره على القلب وأجمع المسلمون على جواز التسبيح والتهليل والتحميد والتكبير والصلاة على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وغير ذلك من الأذكار للجنوب والحائض قال أصحابنا وكذا إذا قال, إذا قال للإنسان خذ الكتاب بقوة وقصد به غير القرآن فهو جائز وكذا ما أشبه قالوا ويجوز لهما يقول عند المصيبة إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إذا لم يقصدا القراءة قال أصحابنا الخراس خراس خراسانيون قال أصحابنا الخراسانيون ويجوز أن يقولا عند ركوب الدابة سبحان الذي سخر لنا هذا وما كنا له مخرنين وعند الدعاء ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار إذا لم يقصد به القرآن قال إمام الحرمين فإن قال الجنب بسم الله أو الحمد لله فإن قصد القراءة عصى وإن قصد الذكر أو لم يقصد شيئا لم يأثم ويجوز لهما قراءة ما نسخ التلاوة كالشيخ والشيخة إذا زنيا فرجموهما The author now goes into a mas'ala called Are you allowed? Are you permitted? To recite the Quran without purification, I am not in a state of tahara. Am I allowed to read the Quran? The author here says, It is recommended that the reciter recite the Quran while in a state of purity. So here he says, Wa yustahab. It is recommended that the person reads the Quran in a state of tahara. If he reads it, but there is nothing wrong with reciting without having made ablution according to the consensus of the scholars. 
But if he reads it muhdithan, which is that he's got minor impurity, jaza it is permissible bi ijma'il muslimina by consensus of the Muslims, wal aharitu fihi kathiratul ma'rufa. And the evidences pertaining to that are excessive, a large in quantity, and it's well known. There are many hadith to prove this point. Regarding he who recites without having made ablution, the Imam of al Haramain states, it should not be said that he has done that which is disliked, rather he has left that which is recommended, i.e. making ablution. Imam al Haramain. Abu Ma'ali al-Juwayni rahimahullah from Ma'imma al-Shafi'iyya and he's going to quote him a lot because he's a Shafi'i and so is Nawi a Shafi'i so Al-Imam al-Haramain Abu Ma'ali al-Juwayni rahimahullah has a book, big book in the Madhab al-Shafi'iyya it's called Nihayat al-Matlab Fi Dirayat al-Madhab it's a book that's reached his 30 volumes he wrote Al-Imam al-Haramain is the author of Al-Uraqat He's the author of he's the author of Al Waraqat. He's the one who authored that book, Al Waraqat. And then Imam uh, Al Haramain, Rahimahullah, he says, "Wala yuqal urtakaba makruhan." You can't say this person has done a makruh, <coughs> but huwa tarikun al afdal. But this person has left what is virtuous. It's not makruh what he did, but he left off what was very virtuous. He could have got a lot of reward for. Naam. If the reciter cannot find water, he should make tayammum. So if, what about if he can't find water, Abu Ma'ali al-Juwayni says, he does tayammum. And a woman who has passed her typical period of menstruation but still sees blood, she cleanses herself, form ablution, and then recites. The woman now is mustahada. Mustahada is, are you with me? And mustahada is called continual bleeding is when the woman just consistently is bleeding. There's no stopping to it. It's not menses. Huh? The woman has three types of blood that come from her. The first one is hayl, which is menstruation. The second one is called nifas, which is a postnatal bleeding. And the third one, which is istihada, which basically is continual bleeding. Continual bleeding, which is that her body is, is uh, producing blood that's unnecessary, has no reason. The Prophet told us, Ali so the reason that's bringing it. But this is called istihada. So what does this woman do when she wants to read the Quran? The woman who's in a state of istihada, the Shaykh says, Al-Imam al-Haramayn, wal-mustahada fi zaman al-mahkumi. While she's in that period, which he said that she's, she's the, the, the woman who has istihada, can she have intimacy with her husband? No, she can. Mustahada, istihada. The woman who's consistently bleeding, she can. She's normal. This blood is not high. You see, she just, they just need to know the difference between when it turns into high. And there are ways that scholars verify that. There's a zaman called zamanul mahkum, they call it, fuqaha. Zabulul Mahkum is the time where she is said to be pure. And that's the time that she's not on her menses. Does that make sense? That the istihada here is just that continuous bleeding. It's not menses here. That continual bleeding, while she's on it, she's pure. She's allowed to do what? Everything. There's nothing she stops from doing. You see? Because this blood, blood will never stop. It will never stop. But the author, Imam al Haramain, says even that though she's pure, she takes the hukum of a muhdith, which is that a person who lost what? Tahara. Like, you know, if a person passes wind or goes to the toilet, what do they do? They need to come with wudu, right? She say, he, he say that she's pure, but she needs to come with wudu. Uh, she needs to come with wudu. Those in a state of major ritual impurity, such as after having had intercourse, and menstruating women must neither recite the Quran nor touch it. The woman who's wa'amal junub wal ha'id, the woman who's on janaba, she's in a state of janaba, 
or he's in a state of janaba. Janaba means after sexual intercourse. The state that the people are in is called janaba. Or if a guy has a wet dream or a woman has a wet dream. This is called what? This is called it's a state of janaba. Well, ha'id, ha'id is menses. Those are called major impurity. When you have to come with wudu, it's called minor impurity. But when you have to come with ghusl, it's called what? Major impurity. He spoke about what? The minor impurity. What did he say that the minor impurity is? Is that that person has left the... Yeah? He has left the tariqatul afdal, the minor impurity. When you're in a minor impurity, reading the Quran, what did he say? You've left the what? You've left to a tariqul afdal. Sah? Are you with me, brothers? But what about if the person is in major impurity? Either by being in a state of janaba or a state of hayr. The author here says, فَإِنَّهُ يَحْرُمُ عَلَيْمَا قِرَاءَةَ الْقُرْآنِ Here is haram for them to read the Qur'an. He says it's what? He says it's haram. Are you? Regardless of whether it is a single verse or less. So he can't even say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He can't say anything. That's if you take Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as to be an ayah. Are you there? He can't read anything from the Qur'an. He can't. Are you? Instead, they are allowed only to recite it in their hearts without uttering its words. So they can say Bismillah in their heart. They can read everything in their heart, but they can't say anything. Are you? It is also permissible for them to read from it without uttering its words. So they can look at the Mus'haf. Are they allowed to touch it? Of course, for, of course according to them, no. Sah? So she's not allowed to touch the Mus'haf. Are you? The scholars are unanimously agree that it is permissible for the menstruating women and those in the state of major ritual impurity to glorify their Lord by saying, to, by saying the takbir, to say Allah Akbar, and takbir, to say la ilaha illallah, to supplicate and make salat and salam or pray to the prophets of Allah. So she's allowed to do, and he is allowed to do the one in the state of Janaba. All of them are allowed to do what is known as a tasbih, subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. They do tahleel, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha tahmeed, alhamdulillah, Rabb, they do it. Takbir, Allah, they do all of that. Was salatu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sending salutation on the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. Wa ghayri thalika bil al-athkar. And all the other athkar there is. He does it. The junub and the ha'il. Naam. Our companions, those who attribute themselves to the Shafi'i school of thought, have stated that there is nothing wrong with menstruating women and those in a state of major ritual impurity, saying, Oh Yahya, hold on to the book. Provided that they did not mean to recite the Quran, it is also acceptable to say, To Allah we belong, and to Him is our return, in the event that they are befallen by a calamity, as long as they do not intend the recitation of the Quran. So, what now he talks about an issue called if a person reads verses of the Quran not with the intention that it's Quran. So he comes and he says, خُذِ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ Ya Yahya. He's talking to a guy called Yahya. Yahya, خُذِ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ Take the book with strength. He gives him, he's giving him a book. But it doesn't mean the Quran. That's it. It's permissible, they say. A person, they lose a loved one. And they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Isn't it? It's, it's, it's part of an ayah, right? Yeah? So he does it, he does that. And he's not reading it because it's Quran. He's not intending it for Qiraatil Quran. Then they say the Shafi'iyah, they say it's permissible. Qala ashabuna. Ashabuna here doesn't mean the companions of the Prophet. When he says Qala ashabuna, what does he mean? Ashabuna means our our followers. Yeah? We Shafi'iyah believe he means. Yeah? Our companions from Khurasan have stated that it is also permissible to say, Glory be to him who has made this subservient to us, and we could not possibly have done that of our own accord upon mounting a camel or any other beast of burden. Now, du'az, 
For example, when you go into the uh, your car and you're in a state of jalab or sister's in a state that she's in hayl, she can she say that can she make dua? Subhanallah, sakhara lana hada wa ba kunna lahu mukrinin wa inna ila Rabbi na lamun qalibun. Yeah, is she allowed to make it? He said yes. Ashabul al Qurasaniyun, they said that you can. Naam. When one supplicates, he may say, Oh Allah, bring us good in this world and good in the hereafter. All of these are verses from the Quran, but he's saying it ala wajhin in a way that's not intended to be the Quran. So he can also make this dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasila fi la akharata hasila wa qila adhaab al-nar, he can say that. Naam. The Imam of al Hamain also stated that if the individual who is impure, i.e. major with your impurity, says, in the name of Allah, and all praise is due to Allah, with the intention of reciting, then he has committed a sin. But if he simply said it for the sake of mentioning his Lord, or had no real intention at all, it is not considered sinful. No. It is also permissible for someone upon major impurity to recite that which has been abrogated from the Quran, such as, if an elderly or married man or elderly woman commit adultery, then stone them to death. This is now a very... Uh, uh, this used to be a verse in the Quran. This ayah, yeah, it is a shaykh wa shaykhatu ida zanaya farjumuhum al battata nakana min Allah. Wallahu azizun hakim, I think that's what the ayah was. It used to be an ayah that was read, but it got abrogated in its wording. Its meaning is in the Quran though. The meaning still stands in the, in, sah? The meaning is, it still stands. I mean, we have to still follow the meaning. The point is, um, this ayah is abrogated. It's no longer in the Quran. Is a person allowed to read it according to Imam al-Haramain? You can still read it, no problem. It's an abrogated verse. So they are, they are allowed to read it, even if they're in a state of major impurity. That's what he, he mentions. Faslun. في التيمم لقراءة القرآن إذا لم يجد الجنوب أو الحائض ما أن تيمم ويباح له القراءة والصلاة وغيرهما فإن أحدث حرمت عليه الصلاة ولم ولم تحرم عليه القراءة والجلوس في المسجد وغيرهما مما مما لا يحرم مما مما لا يحرم على المحدث كما إذا اغتسل ثم أحدث وهذا مما يسأل عنه ويستغرب فيقال جنوب يمنع من الصلاة ولا يمنع من قراءة القرآن والجلوس في المسجد من غير ضرورة كيف صورته فهذه صورته ثم لا فرق في ما ذكرنا بين التيمم الجنوب في الحضر والسفر وذكر بعض أصحاب الشافعي أنه إذا تيمم في الحضر استباح الصلاة ولا يقرأ ولا يقرأ بعدها ولا يجلس في المسجد والصحيح جواز ذلك كما قدمنا ولو تيمم وصلى وقرأ ثم رأى ما أن يلزمه استعماله فإنه يحرم عليه القراءة فإنه يحرم عليه القراءة وجميع ما يحرم على الجنوب حتى يغتسل ولو تيمم وصلى وقرأ ثم أراد التيمم ثم أراد التيمم لحدث أو لفريضة أخرى أو لغير ذلك فإنه لا يحرم عليه القراءة على مذهب الصحيح على المذهب الصحيح المختار وفيه وجه لبعض أصحاب الشافعي أنه لا يجوز والمعروف الأول أما إذا لم يجد الجنب ماء ولا ترابا فإنه يصلي لحرمة الوقت على حسب حاله ويحرم عليه القراءة خارج الصلاة ويحرم عليه أن يقرأ في الصلاة ما زاد على الفاتحة وهل يحرم عليه قراءة الفاتحة فيه وجهان الصحيح المختار أنه لا يحرم بل يجب فإن الصلاة لا تصح إلا بها وكما جازت الصلاة للضرورة مع الجنابة تجوز القراءة والثاني لا يجوز بل يأتي بالأذكار التي بها 
بل يأتي بالأذكار التي يأتي بها العاجز الذي لا يحفظ شيئا من القرآن لأن هذا عاجز شرعا فصار كالعاجز حسا والصواب الأول وهذه الفروع التي ذكرتها يحتاج إليها فلهذا أشرت إليها بأوجز العبارات وإلا فلها أدلة وتتمات كثيرة معروفة في كتب الفقه والله تعالى أعلم Section, Tayyumum and recitation of the Qur'an. The author here, he talks about At-Tayyumum. Tayyumum is when you can't find water anymore. You use the dust to recite the Qur'an. Naam. Individuals in a state of major ritual impurity and women who have just completed their menstruation should perform Tayyumum if they are unable to find water. So if the person can't find water, and he's in a state of janaba, or in a woman's in a state of hayl, she then and she can't find water. Tayammama, they use they do tayammum. Yeah. Having done this, it will be permissible for them to pray, recite, and perform other acts of worship. <coughs> if they should then nullify their purity by doing any of the things that nullifies the law, it will not be permissible for them to pray, but it is still permissible for them to recite the Quran sit in the masjid and perform any other acts of worship that is allowable for those in a state of minor impurity. Sah. Such acts of worship are equally acceptable for he who nullifies his wudu after having made a ghusl. And this is a, peculiar, this is a peculiarity that some have asked questions regarding. The underlying query being, how could he who is in a state of major impurity be prevented from praying, which is mandatory, but not from the recitation of the Qur'an, from sitting in the masjid, even without necessity. This is possible in a situation like the one we have just mentioned, i.e. that those in a state of major impurity cannot find water and so make tayyamun, and then nullify their state of minor impurity. It should be noted that there is no difference between the traveller and the resident who are in a state of major impurity with regards to tayyamun. Some among the companions of Imam Shafi'i were of the opinion that residents, i.e. not travellers in a state of major ritual impurity who perform tayyamun, are only allowed to pray, but must not recite or sit in the masjid afterwards. The more correct opinion, however, is that this is permissible. If one performs tayyamun and then recites, if one performs tayyamun and then prays and recites, but then finds water afterwards, it is obligatory upon him to use that water and unlawful for him to pray, recite, or do anything that one in that or do anything that one in a state of major which impurity is forbidden from doing until he makes ghusl. If one performs tayyamun, prays, recites, and then seeks to perform tayyamun again due to, the, due to the, the nullification of his first tayyamun, or for the purpose of praying the next obligatory prayer, or for any other reason, it is still permissible for him to recite the Qur'an between the two tayyamuns, according to the more correct of the scholarly views. Some of Imam Shafi'i's companions were of the opinion that this is not permissible, but the view that it is permissible is more correct. An individual in a state of major ritual impurity who can find neither water nor sand must pray regardless of his state if he sees that the time of the obligatory prayer will expire. However, it is not permissible for him to recite the Qur'an after praying or recite any chapter of the Qur'an in addition to Al-Fatiha in his prayer. But is it forbidden for such an individual to recite even Al-Fatiha? The first of two opinions on this is the first of two opinions on this issue is that it is not forbidden and rather it is obligatory. But just as it is permissible for such an individual to pray in a state of impurity owing to the dire necessity, it is likewise permissible for him to recite al fatiha for the same reason. The second opinion is that it is not permissible and that he should limit himself to saying that which is prescribed for one who has not or is unable to memorize anything of the Quran. The reason being that he who is unable to do that which is required, in this case purify himself for prayer, due to a legitimate legislative reason is the same as he who is unable to do what is required due to a physical or mental handicap. The first of the two opinions, however, is the correct one. Do you do a handicap? Yeah, physical or mental handicap. The first of the two opinions, however, is the correct one. It is necessary that such rulings be known and understood. And this is why I have briefly made reference to them. There is, however, much more to be read with regards to these rulings in the books, in the books of jurisprudence, and Allah knows best. <laughs>